Hi, in this video, we're going to take a look at supervised learning with decision trees. All right, so a decision tree is a collection of if this or this rules that give us a pretty easy way to determine to make a decision and make a prediction with our data. Now, decision trees are like a fundamental aspect. It's the the, the fundamental building block of things like you know stochastic gradient boosting and random forest. But the decision tree by itself is a powerful tool that I personally use on every single machine learning project I work on. I always build a decision tree to help me understand what's going on with my data. I also always build a simple linear regression model because they're so simple and so fast to build. Same thing with decision trees. All right, so we can use them for like making predictions. They're not the best for it, but they, they, they give us um, very simple rules that we can articulate to people. So I've used them, for example, when a, a stakeholder comes to me and they want a simple rule that they can give their, their, their employees uh, about how to make a decision on a record that comes into them. Well, they want to know, you know, should it go left or should it go right? They want it yes, no, maybe, or a collection of decisions. Uh, you know, different ways to go. And the decision tree I found is an easy way for me to identify the cutoffs for those left, right, yes, no, correct, incorrect decisions. Also, these are very good because they provide graphical representations for the decision-making process that, that we go through when we use the decision tree. Also, if I'm gonna be doing a, a ensemble model like stochastic gradient boosting or random forest, I'll build a, the best decision tree I can, show that one tree and just say, hey, we use multiple trees in this model. So decision trees have a lot of use for helping our stakeholders understand the situation when we're using more complicated models. They're good for just helping us understand what's up and they're good for helping us just build simple if then rules based off of data instead of you know prior beliefs you know to, to help our stakeholders make a decision all right so let's go ahead and work through this so i'm going to be working on the prepared data set that i built before for uh, deciding if a mushroom is edible or inedible now this is coming from kaggle it's a kaggle data set and um, in a previous video, I show how I do my data prep. Something that's important about this data that I've got is that when I took my categorical data and I did my binning, I did binary binning. I put approximately 50% of the records in one bin for the categorical variable and the other 50% in another one and put zero or one depending on uh, it was it more, you know, was it more likely to be edible or more likely to be inedible depending on the categories. All right, and so the reason why I do that is that's a very easy way, you'll see in this uh, upcoming trees, that I can identify which variables are really important for this. And here I'm splitting my data into train and test because on this data set, we don't have that uh, given to us on this particular Kaggle data set. All right, so a decision tree is, you know, you can think of it as a flow chart of if-then statements. All right, so each, internal node represents a test on attributes. And depending on what attribute we see, we're going to go left or we're going to go right on our tree. If, if, you know, we'll make a decision based off of what we see off of the individual record. Now, each branch represents the outcome of that test. What am I going to do next after I go through this? And it'll be a flow chart of how to reach a conclusion based off of the record. And each leaf of the tree, so the, on my flow chart, at the very top is going to be the stump of the tree, and we're going to go down, and we're going to call the bottom leaves, and that's where we make our actual decisions. And so each leaf will give us a class label of where I make that call. So for this example, it's going to be uh, the either edible or inedible, uh, depending on what the leaf says at the end. Now, if I'm doing a regression problem, each leaf, the value that I'm going to use for prediction is going to be the average of the records that end up in that leaf. Here, we're going to be doing a classification example, and we're going to take the most frequent uh, category, which is edible or inedible on this particular problem, and we're going to use that one as what we call for our result when we look at the individual mushroom. All right, 
So let's go ahead and get our data down to just the training set. So here I'm using the filter function from dplyr to get only the training data. And I'm going to build my model, but I'm going to get rid of the columns that I don't want as predictor variables. So the classification is the, um, you know, I, I don't want that in there and because uh, in the data prep, I have an E or P for edible or poisonous. I created another target variable that was zero or one, one for edible, zero for poisonous. So that class I don't want because it would be redundant with the target variable that I've created. And the train test column that I have is a partition column that's not a predictor column. I built that in a previous uh, code chunk. Now, to build the model, we're going to use the R part uh, function and the R part package. You know, it's going go with some namesake stuff here. I like this package a lot. I've used this professionally. There are other ones such as C tree that are very good or C50. Um, I started using this one really well, had some early success, and I've stuck with it ever since. But other packages are darn good also. All right. So how I've set this up is I've filtered out all the columns I don't want. So I've got my target variable and all other columns are predictor variables. So I'm going to go ahead and just put a dot saying, hey, I want every single predictor variable included. I'm specifying which data to use, only in the training sets. And this is a classification problem. So I could be doing a regression problem. I could be doing a classification problem, which we're doing here. I could be doing a uh, survival analysis also. And there's one more I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's in the help documentation if you hit, you know, question mark R part. And now in R part, the primary uh, parameter for controlling our tree, the primary hyperparameter that we worry about is the complexity param parameter. So the more splits I have, the more, more times I have a rule to go left or go right, the more complicated the rule is. And so this, contro this complexity parameter uh, controls how, comp how complicated is, is it going to get. And here I prevent things from getting too complicated by setting a maximum depth. And so uh, we, these parameters, max depth is probably like the second most important one I would say overall. Uh, that's one that I've used, for example, when I was doing a stochastic gradient boosting model, which is built up on decision trees. All right, and so now, now that we've got our model, this is just the initial run, what I want to do, I want to show what it looks like visually, and then we'll proceed from there. All right, so right out the gate, here I've got 100% of my data is in here. And here we have, we see that 52% are edible, 48% are uh, inedible, okay? And so if odor equals zero, and that's a yes, what's gonna happen is that we're gonna, so we, we look at, you know, does odor equal zero? Remember, I've got that binary binning, and if it, the odor is equal to zero, then immediately we put it in inedible, and we can see that 47% of the entire data is in this one node right off the bat. And so we can see that this odor, what odor uh, predictor variable is very powerful at just splitting up the data. Now, if the answer is no, that is the odor equals one, then we can see that 53% of the data lands in this bin and 97% of those records in this bin are edible, 3% are poisonous. All right, so that's actually a pretty good split off of one predictor variable because of how I did my binary binning. I didn't know it would work out this way, by the way. I was just going through and just following the, uh, the process that I do professionally. Immediately off of the binning, if I smell certain odors, I can say pretty confidently, 97% confidence off of this, that's gonna be edible or poisonous. If I smell other odors, I can be pretty confident over here that it's poisonous, All right? That's pretty good, right? Just off of one thing, just smell it, and then I can make a decision. If I smell something I don't like, boom, I don't eat it, I move on. If I, if I smell something that could be edible, I'm not completely convinced. I don't wanna be poisoned. Let's go ahead and pull in another variable. So let's now, let's look at the spore prints. 
All right, so if we see that the spore print equals zero, that's our, uh, our, our test here. So now up here it says yes, it says no. All right, so if the spore print equals zero is no, so here the spore print is equal to one, then we can see that all of those categories for that binary binning that I did for my data prep, so uh, we have uh, odor equals one, spore print equals one, then boom, that's 44% of our data. And we can see that all of those in the training set are edible. Okay, that's pretty good. Now, what about when spore print is equal to zero? So yes and no, spore print equals zero is yes. So the yes on the left means that we always say we left goes to the, yes goes to the left, no goes to the right. Spore print uh, color equals zero. Yes. All right. Now we're talking about 9% of the data. Now this is the harder 9% to classify of the data that I have. So now we're going to look at the population. The, now if the population equals zero, then we're going to call it out as being poisonous. If the uh, population is equal to one, so population equals zero is no, we go to the right. And now we've got it down to you know, 97% uh, of these are, uh, are are going to be edible. All right, so not really as much of an improvement as we would like from here to here. Um, you know, that's because there's not much of the data being, you know, shaved off here. But, you know, we, you know, we've got, you know, we, we can be more confident about what's going on. All right, now here are some advantages of decision trees. They're simple to understand and interpret. They require very little data prep because the way that we build up decision trees is that if I have ordinal data or I have numeric data, any transformation that does not change the order of the data will not improve the will not improve the model. So if I take you know my data and it's let's say it's all positive and I take a square root that transformation or without it is not going to influence the accuracy of that model. If I do a box Cox transformation on positive predictor variable data, the box Cox is not going to improve the data because of how the cut system works. And because of that, so like above, you saw that the cuts were always going to be, you know, left or right, zero or one. That means that we could say a cut is at 0.5 in between them. And, you know, we can handle both numeric and categorical target variables. Now, so there's some disadvantages. Trees can be very non-robust. There can be problems with this. That they don't generalize overall. So we have to protect ourselves by not making too complicated of trees. That's where that complexity parameter and max depth aspect comes in. Decision tree learners can create overly complicated trees that do not generalize well from the training data. It's a, you know, a big risk with this. Now, another way to represent these rules you know, is also just by writing them out. So here, my first rule is when odor is equal to zero, yes or no, I move on that decision tree. Now here, when the odor is one and the spore print color is zero and the population is zero, then the target value is uh, 0.47. So here, this gives us a, a likelihood, it gives a model probability of the likelihood that's going to be uh, edible. When the odor is one, spore print color is zero, and the population is one, we can see that it's pretty sure that it's going to be an edible mushroom. Now, 3% chance of being poisonous, would you want to risk that if you were in the woods? Now, when the, uh, when the odor is one and the spore print color is one, 100% of our training data says it's an edible mushroom. Oh, and there's a special package for plotting our part trees. Our part dot, dot plot is the package. And we control what we see off of it with the extra command. I like uh, 104. I, I like to see you know what the actual proportions are. And I like to see the percentage of data in each node or leaf. All right, so if we're building a decision tree, there are tons and tons and tons of algorithms for this. Uh, you know, there's conditional decision trees from the C tree package. Our part is the one that I prefer to use. Uh, there's 
C50. Those are probably the biggest ones. And so there, there's plenty of ones to go with. If your stakeholders or coworkers or boss have a preference, just run with that. I find that it doesn't make as big of a difference which one you use. As long as you're doing good data prep beforehand, you usually get pretty consistent results. There might be little minor differences. Now, when we decide to, when we're looking at a node, the algorithm looks at, you know, the data inside that node as we go down the flow chart and it needs to decide, are we going to leave it as is or are we going to split into two more nodes, you know, down below? And so the algorithm, it took this it, and it decided, hey, should we split this? Yes or no. It has to have a criteria. Here it decided to split. It went left and it went right when it did the split. It looked here at this node and it you looked at the criteria and it needed to decide, am I going to split this? Yes or no? And it decided no. Here it decided to split. So it split into these two nodes. Now, when it looked at this node, looked at the criteria for splitting, it decided to split again. When it looked at this node, it decided not to split. And then when it looked at each of these, it decided not to split. So all of the terminal nodes at the bottom are called leaves. And here is the uh, stump of the tree. So it's, you know, it's an upside down tree. So here, there are several criteria that we can use. There's uh, Gini impurity. And so here is where we just take, this is used for classifications. We take the, uh, the probability of each classification that's within that particular node, and then we square it, add it up, and we take one minus that. Now, this ends up being equal to taking the uh, product of all of the different classification probabilities. Uh, all right, well, in, in where we consider a particular order, or we could say it's two times the uh, product of all the different uh, probabilities. Now, th that's one that works well. Now, another one is an entropy measurement, or we call inf information gain, where we take the uh, entropy that we have for the node, and then we look at the splitting after we go through and we check the, so we have the entropy before we split, then we look at the entropy after we split, add them all up. And we see, is there enough of an improvement for me to say, to warrant splitting this node, yes or no? Now, which one you use, you will get different values depending on what's going on. You will get different uh, splitting. Yeah, like sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. I find that overall, it's not going to be that different. Um, this is something that you want to check as a parameter of your model as you're doing your uh, hyper tuning. But my experience, it doesn't really change it that much. Um, if you're doing something like a, a Kaggle competition where accuracy is a big deal, then I would definitely worry about the hyper parameter of this. Um, but if I was just doing something for work, I find that it's not worth to really worry about if I have if I um, if I'm under the gun where I have a time constraint, and if I was doing it for like an inferential tree, I probably wouldn't even worry about it. Also, variance reduction. So this is we use this when we're doing regression trees, and so we look at the variance before and after. So if I take the variance before we split in that node, and then the weighted variance of each node after the split. If I get a large enough reduction, then I want to keep the split. You know, pretty simple. All right, so now data preparation for decision trees. So something about decision trees that makes them like really advantageous for the data scientists is that if I know that I'm only going to be doing that, uh, decision trees. I'm not going to be using like linear regression or generalized linear models, stochastic or uh, I'm not going to be doing neural networks. I know that I'm not going to be, uh, you, you know, doing support vectors. You know what? I can skip part of the data prep, and that's really nice because if I have a a monotone transformation, so something like box Cox transformation, logarithm transfer transformation, Yo Johnson square root transformation, these are all pretty related to each other. But any conversion of my data or like converting my data to like ranks, something like that, 
that would not change the order isn't going to change the accuracy of a decision uh, model. So that means I get to skip a lot of the work on the decision tree uh, data prep if I know I'm going to be sticking with trees. And so this is very, very nice. If I know I'm only going to use trees, I'm not going to worry about Boxcox. I'm not going to worry about Yo Johnson. I'm not going to worry about... Uh, you know, a lot of things. And, you know, this can speed things up, make it easier on me. Also, like I'll have less code for scoring down the road, less code I have for the data prep for the data as it comes in, that's, the, you know, less opportunity for an error to happen in the process. And so, uh, you know, so when we have categorical data, we can do our Remember that we always want to bend our data into meaningful categories. And I like uh, binary categories, like two different levels, high, low for the target variable that I find that works well for like uh, variable clustering. It makes it easier that I can, um, you know, figure out variable importance uh, for the, you know, for, on the prepared version. So it's very nice. Another way that we have to handle things when I have multiple classes is that a lot of implementations of machine learning can't handle non-numeric data. So I have to convert it to numeric in some way, some shape, some form. So if I have, let's say something like states, you know, Wyoming, Alabama, Oregon, Kentucky, you know, like that as a predictor variable, I have to convert that. I might have to convert that over to numbers. Like if I'm using scikit-learn, uh, some packages in R will accept categorical data and factors. Some will not. It depends on the individual function that you're using. All right. So, you know, I can convert over to dummy variables, which will be binary vectors also. Now, another trick that I have, if I have ordinal data, I can convert that over to one, two, three, four, like that. And that'll actually speed up things because computers like integer values very well. Now, it works out that if I have, let's say, I have k distinct values of a numeric or an ordinal predictor variable, if I have k of them, then the largest number of cuts that the algorithm has to check is k minus 1. Well, th think about it like this. If I had, let's say, three different levels of a numeric variable, then it has to just check two different cuts. If I cut here, these two are together. If I cut here, these two are together. And so there's only two possible splits. And so this ends up being pretty fast. So if I'm looking for a faster uh, fitting model with when it comes to anything that's built off of decision trees, I want numeric and or possibly ordinal data to make that easier. So if I had a hundred different levels, then there would be 99 different possible cuts I could go through to split you know, each individual node. All right, now that seems like a lot, but now let's take a, let's consider categorical data. All right, so on categorical, how many subsets are could be generated from a set? Well, it's two to the K, right? All right, so if I have K items in a set, Let's say I'm talking about states. How many ways could I get subsets of the 50 states? Well, that's two to the power of 50. That's a huge number. All right. Now, with decision trees, we're not going to consider the empty set or the full set. So it's for, for us, if I have categorical data, it's going to be two to the power of K minus two because we're not going to consider the empty set. We're not going to consider the uh, full set. All right. And so... That, that's a lot of different ways. And also notice that I've got two different ways for increasing, decreasing on this one, uh, you know, for, uh, for, for the split. And so that's a huge number. So when I'm working with decision trees, I'm doing stochastic gradient boosting, extreme gradient boosting. I'm using random force. Any of these, any tree-based model, I want to avoid categorical data, um, you know, in it's, it's pure form. So like if I'm using random force or ranger in, in R, I don't want to leave it in the original categorical format unless I only have a few levels. Now, if I'm working in scikit-learn in Python, it won't even accept categorical data. You have to convert that over to numeric some way, shape, or form. And so to do that, typically we convert over to uh, dummy variables. I, you know, 
I strongly recommend that you do binning before you do that. Now, when I have ordinal or numeric predictor variables, any monotonic transformation isn't going to improve the accuracy. So this takes some work off of my shoulders. I don't have to worry about it. I can skip worrying about you know data prep on the numeric ones, and I can just go it. So something about this is I don't need to do center and scaling if I'm going to be working with the tree. It doesn't matter what the center is. It doesn't matter what the scale is, as long as the order of the data is the same before and after the transformation. And so this, you know, this, this makes life easier. Now, if I'm doing my data prep and I know that I'm going to be trying a whole bunch of different you know, model structures, I know that I'm going to try linear regression. I know that I'm going to try a Tweety generalized linear model. I know that I'm going to try k-nearest neighbors. I know that I'm going to try random forest. Well, in that situation, I'm probably going to want to center and scale my data. I'm probably going to want to consider Yo Johnson box box transformations for my numeric variables, and that's okay. I'm not going to lose anything if I do these transformations. I just have to make sure that when I score my data in the future, I have the the transformations all set up for to transform them to the same presentation that I used when I fit my model. Now, something we have to worry about a lot with decision trees is that we can overfit, and we've got several several tools to protect ourselves from that. First one is tree pruning. All right, so with tree pruning, what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and actually let it get a little bit too deep. I'm going to let my, my decision tree make splits that I really shouldn't keep. And then I'm going to go back after the fact, and I'm going to just going to go snip, 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 and I'm going to prune off those leaves I don't actually want to include in my model. So that we're pruning that tree. So it goes deeper than we want it. We've got leaves that we don't actually want. And then we go through and we remove it. With the R part package, we're going to use the complexity per, uh, parameter to do the pruning. And so that's that CP that I was talking about earlier. And so here I'm going to set CP equal to 0 0.001. And as the complexity parameter increases, more nodes get pruned from the tree. So if I increase this number, I'm going to have fewer leaves. And you can see that I've got like a list going here. And so if I I gave you a pretty small complexity parameter, and you know, this is you know visually going a little bit deep. You know, you can see that's deeper than the previous ones, but you know, we can go through and read all you know this all the way down. If I was to increase that CP parameter some of these would get trimmed off to give me a simpler model, which we had above. Now, another one is the minimum split. Now, in the minimum split, when the algorithm is looking to split a node into two you know, sub-nodes, minimum split is going to be saying, hey, I need to have at least this much data to split. If I have less than this data, don't split, don't try it, don't mess with it. Okay. And so, um, and this makes sure that I don't ever split when I really don't have enough data to do that in this part. And so as we get deeper, in, so if I get too deep, I'm not going to generalize, but if I don't go deep enough, I'm going to end up like not reaching the full potential of the data. My tree is going to be coarser than it needs to be, by the way. A, a short tree that isn't as that doesn't have maximum predictive power is usually the right tree when I'm trying to explain to stakeholders. I only want to go a, you know through a few decisions left and right for stakeholders when I'm trying to explain what's going on. All right, so here I'm putting uh, complexity parameter to zero. So here I'm on this front on the pruning aspect. I'm saying don't prune at all, but I'm saying hey, make sure you have at least a hundred observations in each node before you split. Here are the rules. And here we can see that we've got a very familiar tree that we've reached to the, we, we, we conclude the same tree that we looked at previously. This is gonna happen. If I tinker with the parameters, different uh, parameter choices when I'm doing a single decision tree will lead to the same tree. Now, maximum depth, this is one that I've used in the past, specifically with stochastic gradient boosting. 
And here I'm going to say I only want to do like uh, 30 splits, either 30 nodes down or 30 splits. I, it depends on which package you're working on. And so this limits how many times I can split all the way down. Typically, what I like to do when I'm trying to explain to my stakeholders is I like to have two splits, you know, the, uh, with a result of like eight nodes is the max I would want to have. So split twice, split each of those again, stop. And I find that that's a, a good presentation uh, to my stakeholders. And so here, when I do that, you can see that I've got, you know, a little bit deeper of a tree. I, I think that this is actually a little bit deeper than it should be, but you know, it's, you know, we got something going on. It's not, not a terrible model. Now, minimum leaf size, this says, hey, I need to have at least this many observations inside each leaf or don't split. So if you're considering splitting, you can go ahead and split, but after you split, check to make sure you have a good amount of data in each one of the resulting nodes. If you don't have a good amount of data in each node, you know, prune those off, go back to the pre-split. And so here you can see that we've got a decent depth of a tree. And here, you know, I was going, I went intentionally to go nuts on this. So this is not good parameters off for this, but you know, this is just something for you to see what's possible. I'm saying, don't do any pruning, pruning and go ahead and keep on going. It's okay to have only one observation in each leaf or in each node. And you can see that, you know, we've got some that have 0% of the data, very, very small. This is not a good model. I would not trust this model. I would not launch this model. I would not present this to my stakeholders, but I want you to see, you know, what, what can happen when we go, you know, go nuts with this. Like 0% of my data, probably not going to be 100% trustworthy, right? Now, another way that we can do this is say that we, we say, I only want to have this many nodes or this many leaves. If you reach a certain threshold of leaves, stop splitting. And we can also say we want a minimum impurity decrease. And so here I'm controlling that, that genie or that entropy or that variance reduction that says, hey, if you don't get a sufficient improvement, don't split. Now, which of these are the right ones to use? It depends on you, depends on your project, depends on your stakeholders, depends on, um, you know, it depends on your boss. The, the, the main thing ab about this is make sure you're building a quality model. How you achieve that quality model, you know, it might be with max depth, it might be with pruning, it might be uh, minimum, you know, sample size inside each leaf. Do whatever works well for your project. Now, one thing that I use a lot at work is I, I like to use shallow trees. What I call a shallow tree is just a tree that just doesn't go too far, doesn't go too deep. It splits a few times and it quits. I just say, hey, don't go too deep. And what, you know, what I get, that's why I show my stakeholders. This is easy to interpret, easy to understand. This is the, the same tree that I presented at the very beginning. And so, you know, you, you can read this pretty easily that, you know, if I was out in the woods and I smelled a mushroom right out of the gate, I might be able to say, hey, it's poisonous, don't touch it. Then if it's like, okay, maybe I'll eat it, I could say, hey, you know what, I want, uh, if I see that the uh, spore print color is a certain classification and the smell is a certain, you know, classification also, I'll, you know, I'll go ahead and give it a try. It's better than starving out in the woods. All right, so something that's important about decision tree is try to keep it simple, have fewer splits, it's, you know, for to help people understand. Also try to have fewer variables involved because if I have to use 50 variables to reach a conclusion, a human being isn't going to use that and it's not going to help them understand. Now our, uh, our interpretation, keep it simple, keep it easy. These shallow trees are great for that. Uh, you know, people can understand decision paths, even if they couldn't understand like a regression model. A regression model, if you look at it, is by far the simplest 
mathematical predictive model you can have that uses any kind of math equation. But a decision tree, really, I'm saying yes, no, left, right, you know, making a decision off of, you know, some simple rules. If I can just answer these questions, I can actually go through and reach a classification or a prediction without having to ever pick up a pencil, right? I don't have to use a calculator. I don't have to use a, a computer. Th this is a flow chart that helps me reach a conclusion without having to use math at all, really. And now another use here that I've done in the past is that when my stakeholders need to, you know, need a decision for their, their their employees to make, you know, calls on. Well, a lot of times they don't want this flow chart presentation. They want, you know, pretty simple. If you see this, do this. If you see that, do this. All right. Well, decision tree gives me those cutoffs. And so if you see this in the data, execute this. If you see this in the data, execute this. And you, you, if you keep it relatively simple, you know, the, the the employees of your stakeholders can execute this, and it's you know, it, and you can greatly have a large impact on you know certain offices with some pretty simple if then rules. Now, when you're telling your stakeholders about your decision tree, highlight the key features, specifically the one at top. the The top split is your most important split. And that because it's your first one, the most important one, you get the most variance reduction off of the top one. Because if you didn't, you would be splitting someplace else. Now it is possible to find feature interactions. It, so one interpretation is if that I, I see predictor variable and then a predictor variable below it in a split, then that's a that shows that there's a possible interaction. If I see multiple predictor variable combinations in the same path, that is a sign to me that there's you know, it's more likely to have an interaction. So if I see you know predictor variable A, predictor variable B, predictor variable A, predictor variable B on the same path all you know going down, that's an indication I want to consider interaction between predictor variables A and B in my other types of models. Now, avoid overfitting. Overfitting is a huge risk. Make sure that you, you know, deal with this in some way, shape, or form that is reasonable for your project. I typically use the complexity parameter, but there are other ways that work really well. And as you saw with other trees, I ended up getting the same tree off of different parameters, you know, to control this. Also, decision trees are fast to build. They're easy and, you know, they, 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 get built pretty fast uh shallow decision trees i mean boom 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 you get it you get it fast and i can it, uh, this is one of the reasons why i use them on every single machine learning project i work on is because i can do you know a shallow tree see you know which are the three top variables in the splits get those i know those are going to be important on every single model i build so i i'm going to pay particular attention to them and also shallow decision trees, you could actually use them like in an ER or, you know, in an emergency situations that you can come up with simple rules that people could follow in a stressful situation compared to like linear regression, like, oh, I need to go and get pencil and paper and a calculator to work on. Decision trees are boom, you got it. I, you know, I can look at some information about a patient or about a record and just by memorizing a shallow tree effectively, I can, you know, score the data without having to use a calculator or a computer. And for communicating results for ensemble models, such as random forest, stochastic gradient boosting, extreme gradient boosting, add a boost, I can use one decision tree to explain, hey, what I did was I built a bunch of models similar to this and I aggregated them together to make a better overall model. And so here I'm showing you a decision tree. What I do personally is I build the best decision tree I can. I show that one and let that represent the entire tree. Now the ensemble models, random forests and gradient boosting are by far the most common. So that's stochastic gradient boosting and uh, extreme gradient boosting. Extreme, extreme gradient boosting for a while 
was the king of Kaggle competitions. I haven't, you know, checked out Kaggle for a while now. Um, I haven't competed in any uh, data mining competitions, you know, since I won my second one. Um, but, you know, it like at the time it was just dominating. And so it uses, you know, these individual trees collected into a forest of decision trees. Now detecting interactions with decision trees, if I see predictor variable A, predictor variable B, and B is in a split under A, that shows that there is a potential for interaction off of this. Now, if I see A and B like popping up in the same path, that's an even stronger indication that there's an interaction effect. And, it's, it's, so if I, and also if I see A and I see B on two different sides of the same split, that's an indication of interaction also. And we can get pretty deep into it. Watch out for overfitting. That's always gonna be an issue with decision trees. And especially with a single decision tree, it's better to underfit than overfit. So, you know, prune it or, you know, put in a max depth, make sure that you have a minimum sample size in each leaf, minimum split size, something like that to protect yourself from overfitting. Now we can also, after I've built the model, let's say I built a model and I felt pretty good about it, but then I realized, you know what? I, I overfit this. I'm not quite feeling good about this. You know, like I, let, let's say I have minimum split of two, minimum bucket of one, no pruning, and I put it at maximum depth of the maximum parameter. You can see that I'm scrolling down. Well, it's, <laughs> the tree is complicated enough that my computer is having trouble displaying it. Check that out. Okay, stop. Please stop. There we go. All right, so this is too deep of a, of a tree. I overshot it. it. It just kept splitting, kept splitting, kept kept splitting. And now I'm like, well, I, I like what's up top, but I, I, I want to, you know, I want to do something about this. So what I'm going to do is I will go ahead and use the prune function to go through and just say, hey, I'm going to take the prune function. I'm going to increase the complexity parameter to just trim a little bit off. And boom, I've got a simpler tree, a tree that I trust, a tree that I have faith in. Now, to make predictions with our decision tree, uh, remember that I'm going to need to have you know things in the right format. So I need to have like you know, a target variable going on in there, and um, I'm going to go through and just you know build a whole bunch of these together. It's going to be the predict function that I'm going to use. Let's see where is that. Yeah, so we use the predict function. So here I'm uh, using predict function to put a prediction for different models in different columns. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to reshape my data so I can compare the outputs, compare the results I've got for the different models. And so here we can see the different models that I built. We have our train and test accuracy. And we can see that overall, like it's pretty good. Remember that we always want to focus on the test accuracy. 0 0.98, 0 0.998. I mean, you know, this is pretty well. That odor predictor variable, like, really works out, you know, to our advantage on this one. All right. So that's decision trees. Uh, super powerful, super useful. Um, it's, it's like very much going like the opposite direction of like a neural network where we have a very complicated model. Here, decision tree, one decision tree, I get to know why things are the way they are, and that helps me understand what's going on. It helps my decision, uh, my, my uh, stakeholders understand what's going on, and it's actually useful for humans without using pencil and paper. This is a very powerful machine learning technique, even though it's not really the most powerful predictive modeling technique, it's powerful overall. And that's, well, that's all I've got for you. Life is short, do math.